Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Nialeti Hanwana. I'm a program officer at the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. I'm pleased to welcome you to We Want You to Be a Proud Boy, How Social Media Facilitates Political Intimidation and Violence. This is the second installment of the Foundation's Violence, Politics and Democracy Speaker Series. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our work, the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation examines enduring and urgent problems of violence, and we do this through basic and applied research. We aim to understand the causes, manifestation, and control of violence. We spread this knowledge to inform policy, practice, and public discourse, as well as to advance uh, scholarship. This year, the Foundation launched Violence, Politics, and Democracy, a multi-year initiative that aims to examine the threats and root causes that, if left unchecked, have the greatest potential to lead to violence in the U.S. and other democratic systems. This series convenes experts in conversation to explore issues around election-related violence, identity politics, the rise of illiberalism, and democratic erosion. So today's conversation will feature insights from an HFG funded report of the same name. Written by Paul Barrett, We Want You To Be A Proud Boy outlines the steps social media companies like Facebook, TikTok, Telegram and others can take to reduce their contribution to increasing levels of political intimidation and violence across the US and around the world. So the views expressed today are those of our speakers and do not necessarily ref reflect the views of the foundation. Uh, before we get into the program, allow me to briefly run through the session's agenda and introduce our speakers. Our session today will begin with a moderated discussion that will take us to the end of the hour. During the conversation, we encourage participants to pose questions using the Q&A or chat function of the Zoom webinar. And we also um, will use the chat function to share speaker bios and other information during the course of the event. Following the moderated discussion, speakers will have about 20 to 30 minutes to answer questions posed during the conversation. The discussion, which is being recorded, will be made available on hfg.org. Now I'd like to invite the speakers to please turn on their cameras as I briefly introduce them. Great. Paul M. Barrett is Deputy Director of the Center for Business and Human Rights at the New York University Stern School of Business. He joined the center in September 2017 after working for more than three decades as a journalist and author, focusing on the intersection of business, law, and society. Most recently, he worked for 12 years for Bloomberg Business Week magazine, where he served at various times as the editor of an award-winning investigative team and a writer covering topics such as energy and the environment, military procurement, and the civilian firearm industry. Barrett is the author of four critically acclaimed nonfiction books, the most recent of which is Glock, The Rise of America's Gun. Justin Hendricks, who contributed to the report, will moderate today's conversation. He is the CEO and editor of Tech Policy Press, a nonprofit media venture concerned with the intersection of technology um, and democracy. Previously, he was executive editor of NYC Media Lab. He spent over a decade at The Economist in roles including vice president, business development, and innovation. He is an associate research scientist and adjunct professor at NYU Tandon School of Engineering. Welcome to you both, and Justin, I'm happy to turn the conversation over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and thanks uh, to the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation for, for hosting us. I'm very pleased uh, to be in conversation uh, with Paul Barrett, who I've had the um, privilege of collaborating with on occasion, including uh, for a small part of the report we're going to discuss today. Um, and looking forward to getting to this conversation and into uh, your questions along the way as well. We'll do my best uh, to incorporate those as we go. Um, I'm not going to do much to scene set here. Um, I think we're going to try to have as much of a, a kind of uh, you know uh, natural back and forth as we can, um, but just to maybe set the stakes. Um, various reports in the news media uh, suggest that across the United States, election workers in particular are preparing really for the worst. Um, there's been reporting of election workers in Arizona um, distributing tourniquets, conducting active shooter drills training staff how to defend themselves, uh, in Maine, being trained to conduct threat analysis and reporting, and in multiple states, uh, racing to put in place rules to limit the presence of firearms at polling sites. 
Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we've seen the response to uh, Hurricane Milton in North Carolina, where armed groups uh, have threatened federal emergency workers. Uh, a man was just arrested the other day in North Carolina, and I believe there have been similar threats in uh, Tennessee against FEMA workers. Um, there's a lot happening in the United States um, and a, a lot of concern over political violence related to our elections uh, and more generally. Um, I could go on with the examples. Uh, but Paul, I want to kind of just invite you for the mo moment to explain your motivation to produce this report, um, what prompted the Center for Business and Human Rights uh, to go at this particular topic in this moment. Sure. Well, thanks, Justin. And as you said, it really is a pleasure to be here with you um, since uh, you have collaborated with uh, quite a few uh, research projects that uh, our center um, has undertaken in, in recent years. And thanks also to the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation, um, which uh, underwrote uh, this particular report and uh, with which we are very pleased uh, to collaborate. Um, and I do wanna make this a conversation and uh, you did more than contribute a small uh, uh, piece to this uh, uh, piece of research, uh, working with your colleague, uh, Dean Jackson, who's a former investigator with the January 6th uh, House Committee uh, to look at the social science related to, uh, to January 6th. And we'll get to that uh, in due course. Um, we decided to undertake this report because there's actually something of a debate uh, about what social science tells us about the role of social media in the kinds of political intimidation and violence um, that you provided just a, a, a taste of, uh, of, of a couple minutes ago. Uh, this debate has uh, cropped up in a variety of contexts. It's cropped up in connection with legislative uh, exchanges about what, if anything, the government should do vis-a-vis -vis social media um, and its uh, role in uh, uh, facilitating uh, political intimidation and violence. It's cropped up in connection with the industry's um, response um, to, uh, to that legislative debate uh, in which the industry has consistently said, well, there is no social science, clear social science evidence um, that our activities are related um, to these social problems, whether it's political polarization in the extreme or actual intimidation and violence. So as we've examined similar questions in the past, such as what is the role of social media in connection with polarization, which is obviously an, a, a related issue connected to uh, intimidation and violence, but somewhat distinct, we decided it actually would be valuable to establish um, what social science has had to say. So we went out and we um, did the work uh, rather than just indulging in rhetoric um, of looking over a period of uh, you know, based more than a decade at hundreds of social science uh, studies. These are studies done by uh, traditional academics, by think tanks um, and others. Um, you and Dean, of course, uh, examined a very substantial body of social science about January 6th in particular. And we came away with several central findings. And I think that's the core of, of what we'll, we'll talk about today. Um, and then we'll branch out into other things. And the central findings uh, are as follows, that social media platforms, and these include the, the well-known mainstream platforms, such as Facebook, X, which used to be called Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. Uh, and it also includes um, fringe uh, uh, platforms. These are mostly on the political right uh, with names such as Gab, Parler, and 4chan. Um, that These platforms can be and often are exploited to facilitate political intimidation and violence. More specifically, and here's where social science is so valuable uh, because of, of, of the ability of social scientists to really uh, zero in on details and make comparisons and so forth that journalists and legislative investigators don't always have the time or resources to do. Um, further finding that we've pointed to particular features of individual platforms that make them more susceptible to extremist exploitation and the fact that some of these features can be changed. There is something to be done about this to reduce the dangers. 
Now, it's really important to add one uh, big qualification to what I'm saying, and then we'll, you'll prompt me and we'll go back to flesh out some of these broader points. The qualification is this. We are not saying that social media platforms are the sole or even primary cause of political intimidation and violence. Many factors contribute to uh, incidents such as the ones you alluded to, threats against election workers. Many factors contribute to uh, episodes such as one of the most prominent uh, uh, in, uh, you know, examples of political violence recently, namely the uh, assassination attempts uh, directed at Donald Trump, uh, candidate for president. Um, we can go into what the multitude of those factors are, but what we're saying here is that social media in particular, because of its effect on how we now disseminate information, and because it is so effective in the hands of people who are trying to distribute sensationalistic and controversial information in particular, that it facilitates this process. It facilitates this phenomenon of political intimidation and violence. It does so by making it easier for organizations to recruit people, to spread extremist ideologies, to organize for particular events, um, and at times even to execute those events, to, to carry them out. So that's what we're saying. We're making a relatively limited claim that, it, that social media is an enabling technology it's not the origin of political animus or acrimony. I want to kind of dig in a little bit to what you found when you reviewed the social science about particular features of social media platforms, particular uh, aspects of, of, of social media networks that do contribute uh, to some of that phenomena that you just discussed. Um, what is it about social media that does make it an enabling kind of right. uh, tool? Well, to start with, some of these features um, are features that are kind of obviously problematic and susceptible to manipulation and misuse. Others are on the surface innocuous um, and you wouldn't necessarily want to eliminate them or even significantly change them. Um, nevertheless, they do help one understand why this particular technology is so useful to people who want to uh, stir extremism, who want to incite people uh, to intimidation and violence. So let's start with the title of the report. Um, uh, we want you to be a proud boy. Um, that, that is a quotation from a meme uh, put on Instagram by the Proud Boys. The Proud Boys are an, a, a violent extremist organization found primarily in this country uh, who were most notoriously uh, implicated in helping to spearhead the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol, and a number of their former leaders are now serving significant prison terms because of their leadership and organization and, and execution of the violence on January 6th. So these are serious dudes who are, who are themselves violent and carrying out violence. How do they spread their ideas? Well, they don't do it necessarily by screaming and yelling at people. They do it with humorous seeming memes, images with short verbal messages on them, one of which we point to, or actually one of the social science studies we, uh, we distill points to, was an Uncle Sam style re recruiting poster, you know, tweaked to be a Proud Boys recruiting poster. We want you to be a Proud Boy. It's, an, it's a very nice illustration of the use of humor, um, the use of uh, compelling visual imagery, uh, and how uh, groups that uh, are involved in a variety of nefarious activities have become really expert at using the features, or as they're sometimes referred to, the affordances um, of social media platforms that may be used for very innocuous purposes, or even to entertain, for example, um, or for very constructive purposes to, to educate uh, and spread um, quite constructive and reasonable ideas, but they can also be turned to these, these darker purposes. So, so the feature is the, the prevalence of memes on Instagram, which is you know, one of the central places you go for visual communication and social media. Another feature, the, the groups function on Facebook, which was created so that like-minded people could gather on Facebook, exchange ideas, socialize virtu virtually and so forth, all um, to the good. But private groups on Facebook, those that are not exposed to the public and which have 
unfortunately not been superintended adequately by the uh, management, the company that owns and operates Facebook, now known as Meta, uh, have been have become breeding grounds for movements such as QAnon, which while it has faded in under that name, its legacy continues with the conspiracy thinking, uh, the notion that there's a deep state that is that is controlling uh, events in this country and incitement uh, to violence. Uh, switch to another uh, very popular uh, platform, uh, TikTok. The, the particular nature of TikTok's very powerful and effective recommendation algorithm, the software that determines what content is put in front of people on their For You page uh, on, on, on uh, TikTok, the, the nature of that algorithm is such that it uh, brings to, to people uh, material that the algorithm determines they may be interested in, but not necessarily interested in for good reasons. So for example, just to illustrate, we cite in, in our report uh, a fascinating study from Brazil um, where uh, a social scientist uh, set up an experiment that whereby she, she uh, liked certain material that had to do with uh, discrimination and shaming and so forth. And within a period of, of 12 days, as she recounted it, uh, TikTok was bringing her to this dummy account videos uh, of inciting and encouraging violence, including uh, attacks at schools. So all it took was an indication of an interest in discrimination, shaming, bullying, and those topics for the algorithm to say, oh, this person might be interested in out and out violence. Let's serve them up videos that advocate violence. Uh, so those are some illustrations of the types of features uh, that we are tried to bring together and bring to the fore so people would understand not just that it's the platforms generally, but what is it about the platforms? How does this work? What are the mechanics? That's what the, that's what the central point of the report is. One of the things that I've observed over the years, kind of looking at this as well, is that it's quite often the case that the platforms have all the right policies in place when it comes to this stuff. Uh, but that it does come down to often either the failure to uh, enforce those policies or or to moderate some of these harms. In some cases, also just engineering uh, mistakes or failures. I know that the January 6th committee's uh, Purple Team social media report uh, that was leaked after the final committee report was published said that uh, uh, the engineering failure on Facebook groups and the way that it was moderated allowed for hundreds of groups that would have otherwise been stricken uh, from Facebook to kind of carry on despite you know clear and egregious uh, examples of hate speech and incitement to violence you know in those groups. Um, so I, I, I don't know I wonder um, if you've learned anything about that, the extent to which you know um, some of these features, yes, we might argue um, it's just fine for, uh, TikTok to spread videos or Facebook to be used to propagate memes um, if, in fact, we have the right policies in place to defend against the use of those same features uh, for for ill. Um, what did you learn about that kind of disconnect between the features on the one hand and the enforcement policies on the other? Yeah, it, it's a really important question. That is just to, to be handed about it. It's not a question, I think, that social scientists have dug very deep into. It, it, it's in some ways, it's a little too uh, practical um, for their techniques of trying to do uh, studies uh, spread across, um, you know, m many different subjects and, and so forth. However, it is a topic that um, uh, groups like yours, Tech Policy Press, our center, many journalists, uh, legislative uh, uh, investigators have looked into. And I think the the, the central finding uh, of the moment on that score is that unfortunately, and even in light of the experience in the wake of the 2020 election culminating in the events of January 6th, social media platforms, the companies that own and operate them have actually retreated from some of the more vigorous enforcement efforts that they put in place and, immediately before and then after the 2020 election. They have actually pulled people back from election integrity uh, teams and redistributed them elsewhere. 
Um, then you've got the uh, example of, uh, of Twitter, now X, um, a, a platform that historically back in the circa 2015, 2016 was notorious as a cesspool of sensationalistic and hateful uh, expression, then to some degree instituted policies and began to do some enforcement. And then the ownership of the company changes and who owns a company and who runs it is, is vitally important. And under Elon Musk, who took over in 2022, uh, X simply stepped way back from what's known as content moderation, the act of filtering uh, content that uh, violates company policies. So X on paper, if you now go to their website still has policies that sound fine, but they are literally just not enforcing those policies. And as a result, um, a whole raft of uh, extremist uh, actors have returned uh, to that platform. And it uh, is basically an outpost for the expression of uh, intimidating and violent ideas. So that's at, at the extreme where you have policies that at this point are really uh, just empty words. I'm going to ask about just a grab bag of some of the features and the social science that you cover in this report, um, and it's very accessible. So for anybody out there um, who is looking forward to reading this, uh, I do think it's an incredibly uh, straightforward entry point into an enormous amount of, of perhaps more complicated material. Um, let's talk about live streaming um, as a function of social media platforms. When you talk about this uh, in particular in the context of, of Facebook, um, there, of course, is the, you know, perhaps uh, infamous Christchurch, New Zealand uh, shooter that I think raised this question most to the fore. But live streaming was also a phenomenon we saw on January 6th as a, a kind of feature of the social media aspect of that day. What did you learn about live streaming? Well, as you said, it, it's a uh, a wonderful feature that allows uh, an ordinary person to become a global broadcaster um, with no expertise and no technology of his or her own. You you simply uh, open a, a Facebook account and there you are. You are broadcasting uh, to the world. Uh, obviously, many uh, potentially uh, fruitful uses uh, for that. The, the question is, is whether when introducing a feature of that sort, the company that has introduced it, which has done so to make its... its uh, its platform appealing to draw in users. And now we're talking about users in the order of magnitude of millions. And in the case of Facebook, even billions of people worldwide. And they're trying to bring those people together so they can communicate and also so they can sell advertising, of course, that those people will look at and bring the company profits. Well, in introducing this wonderful feature, has the company put in place guardrails that would allow it to regulate the use of the feature in that exceptional circumstance when someone is going to misuse uh, the, the, the feature in a, in a really uh, egregious way. You, you alluded to the uh, case of the Christchurch shooter, just in case people are not familiar with that uh, episode. We're talking about a, a terrible incident that took place uh, in 2019 uh, in New Zealand where a, uh, 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 an individual who, by the way, had schooled himself in racist, fascist ideology, primarily on another uh, social media platform, namely YouTube, um, took it upon himself to uh, uh, invade uh, two mosques and shoot uh, some and kill some 51 innocent Muslim worshipers. Um, and he did this live streaming it so that millions of people could watch. Now, Facebook did, of course, notice that this happened and did make an effort to shut down the live stream. But by the time uh, the platform took action, the live stream had already been basically copied and reposted. And it was the, the horse was out of the barn. And uh, to this day, you can still find bits and pieces of this video um, out there on, on the Internet. Uh, this is not, you know, of course, you want to emphasize Facebook was not directly responsible for the underlying evil and carnage here. That was somebody else's fault. Um, but Facebook provides the means for promoting the carnage in, in a fashion that has had direct effects because there have been subsequent mass shootings 
in which the killers have specifically referred to this live stream video as being part of their inspiration. So it's not as if we, we the effects of promoting this kind of uh, horrific activity um, are theoretical. No, no, they're, they're, we, we know that it has a, a, a lethal copycat uh, uh, effect. And the problem is, is that while introducing this wonderful, you might want to call it affirmative technology to live stream, the sponsor of the technology didn't introduce simultaneously some type of way to check the misuse of, of, the, uh, of the technology in a more effective way. And that's a very consistent theme. The introduction of very appealing um, online features that are going to draw a lot of people uh, to use them without the concomitant uh, dedication to safeguards. Um, it's wonderful to manufacture automobiles that allow people to travel distances, whether to get groceries or visit grandma or do a cross-country trip. Um, but you have to put brakes in the car. Um, and then the government has to put speed limits on the highways. Otherwise, this wonderful article of commerce, the automobile, will be misused. Now, you can't eliminate the misuse. You can't, just as you can't eliminate the misuse of live streaming or any number of other social media features, um, but you have to have guardrails. And that's what we've had far too few of uh, in this industry. I just want to ask about uh, algorithmic recommendations in particular. You cover this with regard to you know, multiple platforms. Um, and I think, you know, this is one that's often sort of misunderstood. Uh, you know, there's a lot of kind of competing social science around the role of recommendations. There's some evidence that certain platforms have made substantial changes to improve recommendations. I think we found that YouTube is among that category um, in some of the work we've done prior. Um, how do you think about this? And I suppose also, um, what, if anything, did you learn about the connection between um, the either the volume of content that people are exposed to, um, or the volume of of, uh, of material that's recommended, and any actual effect on on offline behaviors. Yeah, well, they're, they're you know recommendation algorithms, or really the algorithms that de determine more broadly what you see when you go on a. A social media platform. They might be in the form of something called a recommendation, or it might be an algorithm that simply ranks what you see. Um, it's not called a recommendation, but it, it is simply the, the selection of a relative handful of content out of the ocean of content that you might see um, on your feed, or you might see if you do a, a search, uh, whether that's on a search engine or it's on a platform like, uh, uh, like YouTube. Um, but so, so, so recommendation algorithms are, are kind of central to a lot of what we're talking about. You need algorithms to filter. Social media can't work if you were to go on a social media platform and seek to, you know, uh, look at certain types of material and then just be buried in everything on the internet that's relevant to that type of material or that inquiry that you might make or that interest that you've demonstrated. So social media platforms by their very definition need to use software to filter and limit what you're going to see and to establish an order to it and to try to rank it by a certain by relevance uh, or other criteria so th that's the first step the second step is what criteria are they going um, to use to, to rank to rank things so let's deal with a specific uh, example you raised YouTube and there's been a lot of discussion uh, over the years uh, about YouTube. Uh, circa 17, uh, excuse me, uh, 2018, uh, 2019, a lot of discussion, both in social science and in journalism and in in, in our world of, uh, uh, you know, uh, civil society organizations um, uh, about the, the, the so-called rabbit hole effect on YouTube. The notion was you could go onto YouTube demonstrate that you're a relatively middle of the road person, say politically or ideologically, demonstrate that by the kinds of videos you look at. And that YouTube would, if you if you indicated interest in politics, basically take you by the hand and take you to the extreme and begin feeding you more and more extreme um, material. And there was anecdotal evidence that that was happening. To its credit, YouTube, which is owned by Google, which is 
part of a holding company called Alphabet, took action. They responded. They, they realized we have a problem here. Our recommendation algorithm is recommending conspiratorial and extreme material. And they tinkered with it. They fixed it because the, these algorithms are not divinely inspired. They are not found in nature and plucked from trees whole. They are designed by, by people, you know, people who know how to, how to build software. Um, and in fixing it, they dramatically reduced the volume of conspiratorial and extremist material that would tend to show up in, in people's, uh, on, on people's YouTube pages. Um, and that was all to the good. There then is a debate about the degree to which it was fixed. Um, is there still a substantial uh, amount of that type of material being fed to YouTube users? There, there's an argument over that. There have now been social science studies that have been done, and we cite one um, in our report, which is kind of the leading study on this topic, uh, done by uh, researchers at Dartmouth and elsewhere, uh, in published in 2023. And their finding was really twofold, and it's crucial to look at both pieces of both findings. The first finding is that there no longer seems to be evidence of a rabbit hole effect. If you go onto YouTube and you show indications that you're sort of in the middle, not particularly interested in extremist material, you will not be taken by the hand and guided um, to the most extreme material on the internet. Finding number one. Finding number two is if you show interest in extreme material, in incitement of violence, uh, in uh, hateful speech, the YouTube algorithm will at that point be happy to guide you to the vast library of extremist material that resides on YouTube. So the problem is not so much that you that the user will be steered to the problematic vo volume. It is that YouTube exists as a library or a repository of such material. And if you're if you show interest in, in that regard, you will find plenty of material to further inflame um, and encourage your uh, extremist inclinations. So the, the key is not what the average experience on YouTube is. The key is what is the experience of actually the people who we're probably the most worried about, which is people who are kind of looking for harmful content. Um, and I think that piece of research is very helpful and illuminating. And we tried to bring it into the mainstream, explain, distill it, explain it, say, yes, there's been progress, and yet there's still this residual problem. So that perhaps that's my next question, which is um, maybe not so much about a feature of social media platforms themselves, but a kind of feature of the social media uh, ecosystem, which is that there are connections, of course, between these larger platforms like Facebook, uh, X, YouTube, et cetera, and a different set of applications, um, you know, the the kind of uh, four four chan and eight chans of the world, um, the uh, uh, the dot wins um, for folks that aren't familiar with those, the the sites that sort of inherited um, the kind of Reddit forums uh, like the Donald and others uh, that were implicated in uh, the attack on January six, for instance, um, you know, and I think there's also Part of this phenomenon, you know, if you look at uh, something that is covered in your report uh, uh, quite a lot, uh, QAnon as a phenomenon, um, this sort of, I think BuzzFeed once called it a, a kind of mass delusion or uh, something along those lines. Um, but this idea, uh, you know, of mass movements that grow and propagate on major social media platforms um, and then sometimes are either... Uh, the activity on those major social media platforms is either in conversation with um, or otherwise kind of uh, connected to um, seamier or seedier sides of uh, uh, the internet where conversation may get more and more extreme. Right. So what did you learn about this, this kind of like relationship between the major platforms, let's call them the, you know, the, the big corporates um, right. and this often more and more, um, I guess, dark corners. Right. Well, the distinction you're making is crucial. And there are numerous studies that uh, uh, basically cr show the connections uh, among uh, networks of platforms um, so that 
it is crucial to understand that ideas that initially percolate on um, uh, you know an image board like 4chan, which many of our uh, you know uh, members of our audience today are probably not immediately or personally familiar with, it's a very crude looking, um, uh, very rudimentary uh, place to exchange uh, information. None of the bells and whistles of the mainstream uh, platforms. Um, but there, you know, the, the notion of talking about content moderation there is is complete misnomer. The whole point of the platform is to exchange um, increasingly transgressive ideas. In fact, one scholar said that one of the reasons why 4chan is so and 8chan and related so-called chan uh, sites uh, are so popular is because they promote transgressive fun was the term uh, again it's important to understand that people who are talking about uh, uh harming or threatening or killing people they disagree with uh, they often do this in a kind of sarcastic would-be humorous vein um, so a lot of what you see on 4chan is, is framed in, in that way. It starts there and it then moves or just simply migrates to other places where it has a vastly broader uh, audience. One scholar called Parler, another uh, fringe uh, site, preparatory uh, media, particularly vis-a-vis -vis January 6th, which you, you know more about certainly than I do. Um, so the idea being that ideas that begin on Parler um, can then spread elsewhere, for example, to Facebook groups. And one of the scholars uh, that we cite cited in turn a, a Yale, a late Yale political scientist named David Apter, um, who was not talking about the social media uh, context, but a very, uh, I think, trenchant quote that I'll just mention, that people do not commit political violence without discourse. They need to talk themselves into it. And I think that is a crucial thing to understand that, that it requires a certain amount of cheerleading and, and daring and double daring on the part of people who are participating on these platforms before they will move to actually take action. But we've seen over and over again that there is a connection between the online world and the offline world. It, it, there are profuse connections that we describe in the report, that you describe in the report, uh, much of it that stemmed from the work of your colleague, Dean Jackson, who was on the House committee that investigated the January 6th uh, activity that showed how online communication led to offline uh, action. But you can see it in other more discrete episodes, such as the Buffalo grocery store mass shooting of 2022, where the shooter in that case researched um, racist ideology uh, weapons and past mass shootings on sites like YouTube, uh, Reddit, and others. So th the connections are, are, are there to, to be seen, whether you see them in an anecdotal sense, as has taken as been the case with the Buffalo uh, shooting in 2022, or you can see, uh, see it in the social science that's been done that connects multiple episodes um, to this, to this uh, phenomenon. And one final thing I'll say is that some of these fringe sites um, not 4chan so much, but for example, Gab, um, which is a site that the shooter in the 2018 Pittsburgh uh, synagogue mass shooting spent a lot of time before he literally announced on Gab, I'm basically I'm I'm leaving now for the synagogue, and then went went about his deadly activity. Um, Gab has been successful in cloning mainstream platforms features. On, it, on its platform. So for example, it has microblogging that's similar to X. It has the upvoting of, of content that's popular on the platform, similar to Reddit. Um, so these other platforms are clever in terms of, of basically borrowing features from mainstream platforms that their very extreme users find appealing as well. I will uh, also mention that you'd go into some depth about uh, the relationship as well with encrypted messaging uh, applications. Um, and I'll maybe just make a plug for your uh, colleague, uh, uh, Mariana uh, Rosenblatt's paper that she's just published, um, a collaboration with the Center and the University of Texas at Austin uh, uh, Center for Media and Engagement Propaganda Research Lab, uh, which is an excellent look at um, 
the questions around encrypted message apps, which are, are complicated and, and probably so complicated, uh, we can't necessarily get into them uh, too much today. Um, but I want to get to a few questions that we've had uh, before we get into some of your recommendations, Paul, uh, a little later on. Um, we've had a couple of questions, you know, about uh, the, the global context for all of this. Um, we've talked a lot, obviously, about the U.S. Um, my my framing for the conversation was very U.S. oriented. Um, but a lot of the issues around political violence and perhaps some of the most uh, severe examples uh, do come from abroad. Um, what do we know about, um, you know, how things may be different in global majority or global South environments? Yeah. Uh, yes, it, it, I think it's, it's vital. And again, this is where doing the kind of exercise we did of wading into all the social science is helpful because that's something that social scientists have done for us and, and provided a tremendous service by showing that the phenomena we're talking about take place in different geographies and in very different contexts, but that the technology is kind of a common theme. So you, you have to start this discussion with events in, in Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, um, you know, going back to, uh, you know, 2017, uh, at least really years before that even, um, where uh, Facebook was very prevalent. It, Facebook really was the way people got on the internet there. And sadly, Facebook became a tool for all the good that Facebook can do in connecting people in the context of Myanmar, it became a tool in the deadly ethnic uh, acrimony that characterizes that society, uh, whereby the military uh, government, uh, in conjunction with um, Buddhist militant uh, organizations, uh, a different view of Buddhism than many people have in the West, uh, persecuted um a uh, Muslim minority uh, population known as the Rohingya, basically creating conspiracy theories uh, about what the Rohingya were up to, blaming them for all kinds of uh, nefarious activity that they weren't uh, in, actually involved in, and then launching an ethnic cleansing campaign um, that led to uh, more than 700,000 uh, Rohingya Muslims being driven out of their own country. Thousands and thousands of people killed along the way, um, but the, the, the most dramatic and visible uh, 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 upshot of all that was the move, this movement of a huge body of people from Myanmar into name, neighboring Bangladesh, where most of them still reside uh, today in camps of, of various sorts. The, the United Nations investigated this and found, after an extensive investigation, that Facebook, which initially tried to deflect responsibility for any of this, had in fact played what the UN investigator called a determining role in what the UN termed a genocide. There's a debate about those terms. It's really not important to get to the bottom of whether it's ethnic cleansing or genocide. It's a terrible event where thousands of people were killed and hundreds of thousands of people chased from their homes. Everyone knows, knows that now. Um, and in follow-up studies, academics have brought to the fore just how um, the basic use of Facebook as a communication tool um, played a central role in spreading falsehoods uh, about the Rohingya that led to them being killed. So that's that's the the the, the mother load of all these cases. Um, and eventually, Facebook was forced to own up to the fact that it had not done enough, as it said, um, to oversee the use of its technology in a market that it admitted ultimately it knew nothing about. It didn't understand the ethnic dynamics in that country. It didn't have content moderators who even knew the language. They didn't have uh, uh, the kind of uh, AI, uh, uh, artificial intelligence classifiers that could notice in an automated way when uh, uh, rhetoric was getting uh, was getting violent um, and, and threatening to people. Facebook has since gone back, made progress in some of these areas, hired people who do understand Bur Burmese as a language, who do understand Myanmar, you know, but again, way too late for the for the Rohingya. Switch your focus over to India, you know, a tremendous country that is a a, a major social media uh, market, uh, and there uh, a variety of platforms have been used by Hindu nationalists who, at the moment, are ascendant and uh, dominant in, in the country to persecute Muslims there. And the, the main platform that has been abused in this regard uh, there is WhatsApp, 
which is one of the encrypted messaging apps that you referred to a minute ago and that my uh, colleague has just published an excellent paper on. And by encrypted messaging app, I, th that's shorthand for uh, an application that was originally designed basically for one-to-one -one or one-to-a-few people communication back and forth, like a, a message, a text almost. Uh, and it was made encrypted so that outsiders couldn't intrude, whether the outsiders would be you know, your friends across the street you didn't want uh, knowing what you're talking about or, or a hostile government or anybody else. Uh, WhatsApp is phenomenally popular uh, in India, far more so than it is in the United States where its use is growing. Um, and it is so popular and has been expanded in terms of how it is actually used in practice that it is basically like a social media platform itself because you, you can now communicate with thousands of people at a time on, on WhatsApp. Um, and it is therefore a way, if you choose to use it this way, to spread um, your political ideas, which may be very constructive political ideas or social ideas or cultural ideas, or they may be, let's go and uh, uh, chase some Muslims out of town, or even worse, uh, let's grab them, beat them up or kill them. Um, so there've been many studies about the misuse of WhatsApp um, in India, um, in Indonesia, and in other countries where ethnic and religious acrimony often um, aimed at Muslim populations, although not exclusively, um, has been a, a terrible example of how social media has been used to facilitate political intimidation and violence. So we've talked a little bit about how ethnicity, race, uh, religion, some of those uh, factors are often uh, at the center of some of these issues. What about misogyny? Um, that's another question we've had uh, from some of the participants that were prepared uh, prior to the conversation. Uh, what about, uh, you know, hatred of women um, and in various efforts to kind of uh, diminish women's role in, in the public sphere? Well, that's been, uh, misogyny has been deeply woven into some of the, uh, the, the ethnic hatred. Um, it's been, it's been a, a, a major theme, for example, um, in the uh, Indian context, uh, going back a few years, just to to tell some history that actually is helpful history, because this these events really um, were harbingers for much uh, of uh, what was to come. Um, you know, there there was a, a a phenomenon on Twitter, circa 2014 2015, uh, called GamerGate, um, which now, in terms of its scale, seems modest um, because things have exploded in volume to such a degree, but at the time was uh, hugely important. And as I say, really a harbinger. And that involved um, some women critics of online gaming who were making observations about the misogyny in online gaming, the uh, stereotypes, uh, anti-women uh, um, ideology uh, integrated into a lot of online gaming. And for their trouble, and these were people, these were women who liked online gaming. They were criticizing it, not saying we want to eliminate it, but they wanted to be involved with it and wanted to see it improve. They were viciously attacked by the gaming community in uh, gender related terms, threats of rape, of, of uh, uh, death threats. Uh, people were chased from their homes. Um, and so Gamergate is now kind of a, a, a a, a very uh, apt illustration of how, uh, in that case, the platform Twitter um, can be used uh, in, in this regard. And, and these themes uh, continue on Twitter uh, today. Um, and if, if anything, uh, under Elon Musk's ownership, uh, the volume of uh, misogyny on Twitter, along with the volume of, uh, of religious hatred and hate speech um, and other uh, extremist uh, expression, uh, is increasing, not decreasing. So we have one question, which I'm going to probably um, maybe just build on a little bit, uh, which is around efforts to regulate social media in Europe, um, the Digital Services Act, which of course has been in place now um, for you know a, a couple of years, uh, I think fully in place, a little less than that. Um, but when it comes to kind of looking at regulation, um, that may address some of this stuff. 
Um, I assume we don't have any science yet on the effect of regulation on these issues. Um, but is there anything that you'd like to sort of say about that, uh, you know, with that you reviewed as part of this study? Sure. Um, uh, what wasn't central to this study, but I think it, it's absolutely a natural outgrowth of this conversation. So I'm, I'm pleased uh, to move in this direction. So the first thing to say about regulation is, of course, we don't have monolithic re regulation. We have de different developments in different parts of the world um, reflecting uh, a variety of, of political contexts um, and so forth. So let's make some some quick distinctions. You've got you know regulation uh, of a sort uh, in places like Russia and China, wh where the government controls everything having to do with the internet, including social media. People are able to get around that at times using certain technology known as VPNs and, and other means. Um, but for the most part, the government shuts things down when they don't like the way, when they don't like what they see um, on, on a social media platform. Um, at a, another extreme, you have uh, the United States at a national level, where at this point, we don't have any uh, notable uh, regulatory uh, efforts in, in place. Congress has been debating uh, uh, this topic for years now, going back at least till 2017. Um, and uh, there's very little to show for it outside of the exceptional area of some uh, regulations pertaining to children. And there is now active debate about enhancing and updating uh, regulation that might be related to children, although it hasn't been enacted yet. Meanwhile, within the United States, you have regulation at some at the state level in California, New York, and certain other places um, requiring uh, of social media platforms a certain degree of disclosure of how they do business, how their uh, operations actually work. Uh, those regulatory efforts are besieged by lawsuits filed by industry, and it's unclear um, how effective those state level efforts will be. You referred appropriately um, to the European Union, which is where the main body of regulatory activity has actually taken place. You, you uh, alluded to the Digital Services Act, which is um, a, a broad EU-wide, meaning that it applies in various ways to all 27 member states of the European Union. And it imposes certain new disclosure requirements, requirements for that companies do internal risk assessments. In other words, if you are to if you intend to introduce uh, a new feature that you analyze at the outset what problems it may create and report those potential problems uh, publicly, and that the companies disclose a wide array of information about how they are filtering content on their platform. Not so much telling them what policies to have, let alone telling them what content to take down, but requiring them to tell the rest of the world how they are handling um, those responsibilities. How is that working? In the it, it's working slowly because it's it's hugely complex. Mm -hmm. The companies are broadly speaking <laughs> dragging their heels and resisting most of those efforts, raising objections to what the EU is requiring. And it's going to take another year or two or three to even begin to see how that shakes out. In the UK, the United Kingdom, which of course separated itself from the EU relatively recently, um, it, there is more uh, aggressive content-based regulation in place that gives UK regulators, at least in theory, um, more uh, um, uh, authority to actually require that particular content be taken down and taken down within a certain period of time. Um, that situation hasn't really played out yet in, in any detail, um, but I expect it will be. And meanwhile, back in the EU, just for a second, there are several investigations that are underway under the auspices of the new Digital Services Act, whereby regulators are looking into whether companies are following even the modest requirements of the Digital Services Act. And presumably, I think in, in all likelihood in 2025, we'll see what the upshot, what the results of those investigations are. And that could be significant because that will help illustrate whether it's meaningful to require disclosure, risk assessments, and mm -hmm. similar essentially procedural obligations as a tool for trying to get at whether companies are are assuming enough responsibility for how they manage their platforms uh, because there's a there's a very delicate balance here in connection with regulation 
anywhere in any democratic country where freedom of expression uh, is uh, is honored. So again, leave aside Russia or China or Iran and how they handle the internet in those countries. In the EU or in the United States or in the UK or Australia or Latin America, places where 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 first where not the First Amendment necessarily that's the United States, but where free speech is 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 highly valued as a norm, um, you have a tension in that you don't really want to encourage the government to tell platforms you may have this kind of regulation, you may not have that kind of regulation. Um, excuse me, you may have this kind of content, but you may not have that kind of content. You don't want the government dictating those things. So regulation is not a straightforward undertaking in, in that environment. These businesses are not producing automobiles or chemicals, which you can regulate much more vigorously. They're producing trafficking in expression. And therefore, the government has to proceed with great caution. Now, if there's more interest, I'll say a word or two about some other regulatory efforts within the United States at the state level, Texas and Florida, um, where those states have made very aggressive efforts to tell companies um, what they can and can't uh, have on their platforms. And that's all wrapped up in, in litigation as well. Well, there is a question in the Q&A about the First Amendment um, and this, this, you know, the calibration of balancing uh, the protection of free speech that you mentioned, free expression, um, with countering some of these harms. Um, I Maybe I'll just say, Paul, um, you know, thinking about uh, the First Amendment and how it changes the approach here in the United States, um, are, you know, are we uh, at a disadvantage to Europe, which has a different um, way of thinking about these things constitutionally? Yeah. Well, okay, good. This th th That's terrific. And I'll, and I'll use the Texas and Florida uh, cases uh, in part to an answer the question, you know, are we at a disadvantage? Well, that depends a, a bit on, on the degree to which you see wisdom in the First Amendment um, and its, um, you know, relatively stringent restriction on government regulation of speech. Um, well, just to maybe uh, I'll just add a wrinkle there. Um, yeah. I may see great wisdom in the First Amendment uh, and yet uh, have concern about um, the way it's interpreted by today's courts. Fair enough. I mean, everything in the law, everything is in the interpretation, not just in the statement of the of the legal protection or the legal uh, provision. Um, so, you know, it was ever thus with interpreting the First Amendment, at least in in, you know, since the 20th century, where you have a tension between um, the interest in promoting free speech and therefore restraining the government from restricting free speech. That's one interest. And then you have various other societal interests. It might be in preventing violence. So there's a balance in terms of if someone is threatening to commit violence, are you going? Can the government stop them? Well, the government can only stop them if there's an imminent threat of very specific physical violence. In that limited uh, environment, the government can can intervene. Otherwise, you can say a lot of very offensive, very inflammatory things in the United States, and the government is in no position to stop you from, from doing so. That's a, a very broad background uh, illustration of the tension. So let's talk about um, uh, Texas and Florida. In those states, uh, conservative dominated legislatures enacted laws which basically restricted the degree to which platforms like Facebook or YouTube or TikTok could moderate content. So they said, we want, these, these were conservative politicians who said, we want you to filter content less, or to put it the other way around, we want people using your platforms to be able to express themselves more freely without your enforcing rules about things like hate speech. We, you say you want to prevent bigots from speaking on your platform. We think you're preventing conservatives from speaking on your platform. So these laws were enacted. They, had, they have slightly different uh, ways of, of phrasing it. In Florida, the restriction is on speech by or about political candidates. Uh, in Texas, the, the restriction on content moderation said the platforms can't uh, remove or restrict content that's related to people's viewpoints. So those were illustrations. If you were a fan of more aggressive filtering, um, you would say, well, those are those are laws that are going to prevent the platforms from superintending their own their own uh, venues, 
from self-regulating. And sure enough, the platforms went to court and said to those states, Florida and Texas, you are interfering with our First Amendment rights, the right that the company Meta or Google has to determine what speech we want to host. And by extension, you're interfering with, with the free speech of the people who want to have a civil venue for expression as we define civil. These cases are now enmeshed in, in litigation. The Supreme Court actually had a look at these cases um, and without making a final determination, announced several broad principles that are an attempt to strike this balance between free speech and safety and security of, of, of expression. And the central principles that the uh, court announced uh, and then sent the cases back down to the lower courts to apply the principles, the, set, the principles the court announced in a, in a ruling uh, written by uh, Justice Kagan um, were, first of all, that the platforms themselves have First Amendment rights in the same way that a, uh, not identical way, but in a similar way to the fact that a newspaper has the First Amendment right to determine what appears in the pages of the newspaper back in the old days. In the same way, by analogy, the sponsor of a politically oriented parade has a right to determine what views are expressed by means of the parade. In other words, if, if, if a parade is uh, advocating position X, you believe in anti-X, the sponsors of the parade are not obliged to include you in their parade. That's because the sponsors of the parade have a First Amendment right. The owners of the newspaper have a First Amendment right. The Supreme Court has now told us social media platforms have a First Amendment right to determine what speech they host. Moreover, the Supreme Court said, and this was much more specific to social media platforms, the fact that social media platforms allow the vast majority of content that gets posted to remain on their sites and remove only a minority of it, that does not disqualify them from playing that filtering role. Um, so now we will see, and, and the Supreme Court said several other broad principles, we will now see how the lower courts uh, apply um, uh, those ideas. Um, and we're going to have another round with this, these cases returning to the Supreme Court. But the, the central question here um, is to what degree can, in this case, a state government, but really it's broader than that, can any government tell a platform what content it can and cannot have on its platform? And Texas and Florida have gone much further than, for example, the European countries have and have taken action that the United States Congress has come nowhere close to uh, undertaking. But those cases give you a feel for the tension around the First Amendment. Uh, I want to kind of get to a couple of the other types of questions that are here. Um, we have uh, one question, uh, which is around, uh, which I might maybe broaden out a little bit as well, which is around kind of um, people who are doing work uh, to create alternatives. Um, the questioner asks about uh, resisting the algorithm, um, but maybe I would broaden that to um, that that other phrase they use, reclaim the internet, something of the sort. Um, we know there's a big movement uh, to try to present an alternative to today's social media networks in the form of decentralized platforms, uh, phenomena like Blue Sky or Mastodon, um, even to a lesser extent, uh, somewhat Threads, which is a meta product, um, other efforts like that. Um, and then there are a lot of public interest projects, of course, and a lot of public interest groups that are that are trying to kind of uh, revert back or create uh, alternatives. I think of New Public, uh, run by Eli Pariser um, and colleagues there. Uh, but Paul, are you are you aware of other efforts like that to um, try to disrupt some of the dynamics of the social media ecosystem? Um, you know, as it were. Well. You've just ticked off a, a, a vast array of them and, and with tremendous variety. And I'm going to play the game of kicking this question back to you because you undoubtedly know more about this than I do um, through your work at Tech Policy Press, which is, I'll just give a plug for Tech Policy Press, the premier clearinghouse and publication for information on questions just like this. So if you want to know about the vast array of alternative 
uh, platforms, the place to go is Tech Policy Press. Um, but let me offer just one quick observation. And then genuinely, I, I really do want to hear which of those approaches you think shows the most promise. And But here's here's the, the, the fly uh, in the soup. Um, the network effect. The incumbents, for better or for worse, I'd say probably pretty much for worse, had the opportunity to build up their size and acquire during the 2010s their rivals, Meta acquiring Instagram and WhatsApp, for example, and folding them into one big company, uh, to a degree that they now have this massive advantage known as the network effect. If you want to immediately potentially communicate with hundreds of millions or billions of people, there are a handful of platforms already there where you can do that. Twitter, now X, despite its turn toward, uh, you know, back toward, you know, the cesspool, remains somewhat vital and somewhat useful because it still has a certain amount of network effect for people talking about politics and public affairs. There are a certain number of people still on it. You and I provide a very good contrast. You're, you more or less have had it with X and you're, you're out of there, right? I'll confess, I still use it. Mm. Uh, why do I use it? Because I think a certain number of people who might be interested in the work I do or even the opinions that I have um, are still there and might still see what I have to say. So if you're trying to start up a Twitter-like alternative, even Twitter in its reduced form is still a very formidable rival. And it's not such a straightforward thing to have a more civic-minded, um, constructive philosophy and just say, hey, here I am, I'm starting a new social network. When Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk and the, the guys over at, at Google and the Chinese company uh, 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 that owns TikTok uh, are already there and already have the size and the reach that they have. So back to you for for wh what you do about the network effect and and which of those other approaches are promising. Yeah, there are so many different, uh, I suppose, ways to answer this question. But you know, I, I would and Paul's already kind of got to this, but there's an enormous amount of uh, activity both in the U.S. and I think very importantly in Europe. Um, around uh, antitrust and and competition and you know competition regulators like the FTC um, and others kind of even in some cases banding together to try to address some of these issues um, important cases that are before uh, courts right now including against you know Google uh, and Meta uh, and others um, so we'll see if to some extent the 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 authorities sort of shake up the locked up or market that Paul's referring to, uh, maybe create a little bit more room for new entrants to come in and try to do things slightly differently. Um, and then this sort of broader move towards uh, what's called interoperability um, or decentralization, this, this thought about how we make it easier for a person if they, for instance, choose to leave a platform like X, um, yeah, it was a big deal for me and big deal. I mean, you know, in, in the scheme of things, not, but big deal in the scheme of social media to say, I'm not going to use uh, Twitter anymore, uh, where I, th I think I had accrued, you know, uh, some combination of humans and bots following me that, you know, numbered in the many tens of thousands, which was useful as a journalist or as someone who likes to share their ideas. That was difficult to give up. Um, in some of these schemes around interoperability, you'd be able to take your, uh, you know, your your followers and your network with you if, if you leave a platform. Perhaps that underlying uh, medium of of your connections would would remain um, on an interoperable uh, protocol rather than it sort of going away if you choose to leave the platform. So there are some alternatives. There are different ways of thinking about this. There's a a lot of robust debate about this, um, but I'd say somewhere between um, can we shake loose the you know grip that some of these large tech firms have on the market um, from the top down, um, and then from the bottom up, can we create some mechanisms for alternatives to exist? You know, there's a lot of effort in that regard. So uh, some things to look for. Let me, um, let me mention just one thing, Justin, in this connection. 
uh, an idea that I think uh, is quite interesting and this audience might be interested in, uh, you know, that goes by the name middleware. Um, and it goes back to, it, it, it's re related to our discussion of algorithms. There is basically a, a proposal and it, it's, it's kind of in motion, sort of, um, but really hasn't uh, gotten traction yet, whereby uh, people theorize that there could be a marketplace, basically a marketplace for algorithms so that you could have a Facebook account, but that through some mechanism, Facebook would be forced to allow you to then purchase the filtering technology from another vendor and bolt that onto your Facebook account. So you'd have your Facebook network, but somebody else's algorithm that would not um, uh, uh, emphasize or prioritize sensationalism and hateful material to the same degree that the, the master platform's algorithm might, uh, you, you could use this other algorithm. And people could then basically go out in the marketplace and shop for the filtering technology that they wanted. And in that way, shape their own internet to a greater degree, if they're getting the internet, as many people do, through a social media platform. So this middleware concept, um, you know, you, uh, Justin, you say a word or two about where it stands. I, I wouldn't even be able to say exactly how sort of plausible that is at, at this point, but certainly there are a lot of people who like the idea. Yeah, I mean, I think... Um... Yeah, you know, and credit to folks like Mike Masnick at TechDirt uh, for his paper, um, Protocols, Not Platforms, which kind of, if that's a, one thing that I would refer people to on this. But um, we've had a lot of stuff on on middleware and um, uh, decentralization on Tech Policy Press. And as Paul mentions, like right now, a lot of it is sort of theoretical. It's sort of thinking about how things might work differently. Um, but some of that is kind of rubber meeting the road a bit um, as these decentralized platforms grow. We have a piece today on the site from uh, Yoel Roth and Samantha Lai, um, both affiliated with the Carnegie uh, endowment. But um, Yoel is a former trust and safety head at Twitter uh, who came notably into Elon Musk's crosshairs, um, now heads trust and safety at the Match Group. Uh, and Samantha is a, a, an academic and a thinker. On these things, and they're they're talking about, um, you know, what it will take to get to a point where there are interoperable and shared, uh, uh, you know, tools for doing trust and safety on decentralized platforms, um, which would include potentially middleware. Um, there's, I think, a lot of questions about how that market could work, what will be the market incentives, and whether that will um, play out the way that some folks who advocate for that approach to things, uh, you know, whether that any of that will work. Um, right now, the decentralized, decentralized social media environment, um, I think it, it's it's better to kind of think of it as being somewhat um, poor when it comes to uh, having the resources that it needs to do uh, content moderation at scale and even potentially to address some of the things that um, we presently think that the major social media platforms don't do great work on um, in this decentralized environment. Um, you know, we, we could see other types of, of harms or issues that have something to do with the fact that there are very few resources. So we'll see if middleware uh, comes along as, as a solution. Um, I've got a couple of questions here, Paul, about uh, kind of like gaps in, in social research, social science research, um, places where you might advise academics to explore. Um, that's one thing that uh, Dean and I tried to include in our carve out on January 6th was a little bit of advice about um, where there are gaps and where where maybe to look. Um, well, so I can, I can start well, yeah, I can I can mention that uh, perhaps, um, you know, uh, in in particular, you know, um, I think, it, well, I was also setting this question up as a way of, of asking you uh, to comment on the general availability of information and data. Uh, which is, of course, one of the more significant problems um, that that researchers face. And I suspect that, uh, you know, there's an argument to be made that, um, you know, even though the EU has, through the Digital Services Act, has now required platforms to make certain data, data available, all of that protocol could be uh, years away from producing actual academic research. Um, platforms like Facebook have made it harder for academics uh, to get data. Um, we're seeing a kind of, you know, X, of course, which used to be an extraordinary uh, trove of information for researchers has made it much more difficult 
Um, so I, I'm not certain that we're in a better place today than we were a couple of three or four years ago. We're probably in a much worse place, especially going into this election um, with regard to having access to information. Um, that's one of the reasons why January 6th was so interesting um, a major event invol inv involving political violence, um, which was, you know, uh, an enormous amount of data was available. And that's one of the reasons why um, I think social scientists have studied it so much. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, one of the things we point out is uh, gaps include looking at the connections between social media and other media, uh, especially mm -hmm. broadcast media, um, you know, television, of course, but also podcasts and uh, radio uh, in the United States, for instance. I know Brookings is doing a lot of interesting work on uh, collecting data around podcasts. Um, there's been been work around uh, talk radio in particular, um, and more recently on you know uh, some connections between uh, broadcast cable uh, news networks and that that sort of thing. Um, but then more generally on people's uh, more, robust and and complete information environments um and how social media kind of plays a role in those you know we we get our information in a lot of different ways and being able to understand uh those and then another thing one that we pointed to um really is kind of thinking about these issues very much with regard to kind of historical context um and thinking about key drivers that are kind of maybe more durable drivers in societies um, in the United States, for instance, um, you know, uh, race is a kind of durable driver or underlying factor um, in a lot of political violence. Um, some of the other types of issues that we've discussed here today um, and how do we kind of better study those things with regard to social media as one aspect of the phenomenon. Um, so those are some things there, but Paul, what else do you see? Yeah. Well, I, I, I want to, emphasize how difficult it is to do research in this area and, and that's for, for for two different two different reasons one of which is structural and one of which is political and out of the moment let me start with the latter um, research in this area has been impeded in the last couple of years by a political intimidation campaign carried out by figures like representative jim jordan of the house judiciary committee who by uh, uh, subpoenaing and uh, otherwise harassing um, prominent uh, misinformation and disinformation researchers has basically intimidated some of those people, not quite into silence, but has definitely backed them off and made them much less active. Um, Stanford had uh, an organization called the Stanford Internet Observatory that in the space of a few years became one of the most prominent analysts of misinformation and its use in connection with politics, including in connection with political intimidation and violence. That uh, institution basically does not exist anymore because it was beaten down by the Jim Jordan investigation. And Stanford decided rather than to standing up and fighting against that, we're gonna, we're, we're gonna just wave the white flag and back away. And the top researchers are gone. Now, some of them are resurfacing elsewhere, of course, they're not done with their careers. Um, but that center of activity was stamped out. Uh, similar people doing similar research elsewhere have been intimidated in a similar fashion, um, not necessarily with quite the same dramatic results, but with with similar results. So that's one thing that's going on right now and and can't be ignored. Then there are structural problems. Media as a an institution are difficult to research. This and this goes back generations and generations to earlier iterations of technology. This observation you know, came to the fore in connection with radio, in connection with television. What effect is radio having on people's political opinions and views? What effect is television having? Very difficult to specify because of the profusion of influences that exist on people. So in the context of social media, it's difficult to sort out the relative effects of different influences as, uh, uh, Justin, you were just indicating, and just to give you know a, qu a quick snapshot, a Twitter feed carries a Fox News segment highlighting a false election fraud claim by Donald Trump. Who, who, what's the source of the misinformation about the false election fraud claim? Well, it's the political leader, separate from technology, 
you have the most prominent figure on one side of the political spectrum spewing a certain variety of lies that have had a very corrosive effect on our politics. So the source is to some degree, the political leader, it's the cable television network that has, you know, is basically a servant of that political leader, but that which disseminates a great deal of its content, not over television, but via Twitter and other social media platforms. So to what, what responsibility do you attribute to the social media platform? Not so straightforward to say. It, it's it's all of the above is the sophisticated way of looking at it. And so it's, it's, it's not easy to proceed. Another structural problem. It is really difficult in this area to set up traditional empirical studies with control groups and so forth. Let me give you an example. We, we cite one study in our report from a academic journal called Studies in Conflict and Terrorism. It's a very interesting study. It looked at 235 convicted terrorists in the UK and came to the very tentative and appropriately qualified conclusion that so use of social media had over time increasingly contributed to the radicalization of these convicted terrorists. So no controversy that these were people inclined toward violence um, and the social media played a role, but it was impossible to say with more precision exactly what the role social media was, because it was impossible to assemble a control group of another significant number of extremists who had not been exposed to social media. Like, how would you do, even do that? So you have a, a, a nice piece of social science that deserves attention and that actually fits with our thesis in this report that social media is playing a facilitating role, but it's difficult to go further. Um, because setting it for the simple structural reason that using the methods of social science, it's difficult to, to find control groups when looking at the violent consequences of social media communication. So it's really challenging. Paul, I want to get to some more of your recommendations. I mean, I think it's right. you know always a, a recommendation and everything that we end up writing together. Um, that there be more transparency, that, that, that government mandate more transparency, that companies provide more uh, transparency, and that they cultivate academic, academic and civil society um, researchers who can answer these types of important questions. But um, what other recommendations uh, would you like to leave the audience yeah. with? Let me highlight two others, one, one for the industry, one for uh, government. So for, for the industry, and this is not something that the government can or should do in this country because of the First Amendment. See our earlier discussion. But these are, are design changes um, that have to do with communication. So again, that's why you don't want the government telling com uh, companies that they have to do this. Design changes that could be made that would mitigate some of the harms we've been talking about. <clears throat> Anonymity is one of the central features of much of social media. Um, you know, Facebook nominally requires uh, 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 users to identify themselves, but they don't do very much by way of verifying that identification. The fact that people, um, you know, can can do and say what they do on the on social media without them having to take responsibility themselves by being identified is a, a crucial feature. <clears> that that should end. Um, you need user verification. You also need protections of user identity so that once the person, for example, has been identified by the company as being this is a legitimate person using their own name, that that information would not then be released to the public. So it's, it has to be done in a careful, thoughtful way to protect privacy, but total anonymity is an invitation to mischief and worse. Uh, group features need to be monitored for the advocacy of of intimidation and violence. Uh, invitations to group features need to be monitored for the same reason. And if a, you know, a, a, group, a, a group is inviting people, basically come to our group and let's discuss how to violently overthrow the government, come to our group, let's discuss how to intimidate election workers, um, that the, 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 uh, the platform needs to shut down. Um, recommendation systems need to be revised. Again, they, they are not handed down from God. They are not plucked from nature, from trees. Um, they are designed by engineers and data scientists. Um, the degree to which 
uh, engagement, this metric which measures how much people interact with content, how much they reshare it, um, comment on it, like it, dislike it, et cetera. The fact that that is a, such a central criterion for whether content gets promoted is a very problematic aspect of the design of most, if not all, social media platforms. The prominence of engagement should probably be reduced and the uh, significance of criteria like authenticity, uh, sourcing from authoritative uh, uh, so sources of information should be increased. Uh, platforms have actually experimented with taking these steps for short periods of time. It is doable. They've shown good results. Uh, they need to be pursued more um, uh, diligently. And a final design uh, thought is to increase what's known as friction. Um, m minor interventions uh, that can cause people to slow down a little bit, think a little bit uh, about what they're about what they're doing. Um, so, you know, do you, are you sure you want to reshare that article? Do you want to read that article? Um, and and similar steps. You actually Twitter has that. That's a good example of, of something. That type of intervention or friction, a little, a little, a few grains of sand in the machine can potentially, uh, social science has shown, slow people down enough so that they rethink sharing something that they're pretty sure that or know is false, um, but might want to be just resharing it just for fun or because it supports their point of view. And you might be able to, uh, to some degree, reduce the spread of misinformation through that means. So those are design changes on the industry side. The gov, there, there's a, Justin, you mentioned transparency. Um, I, I would say that briefly, uh, government could expand the concept of consumer protection as enforced by the Federal Trade Commission um, as a way of requiring that companies disclose more of how they're doing business and make it, and, and demand that they fulfill the promises that they are already uh, extending uh, to their own users. I think we're, we're pretty close to out of time. Um, and so I'll, I'll leave it. Paul, thank you very much. Uh, we got through an enormous amount of material. I tried to hit most of the questions in the chat. Um, apologies if we missed out any one. Um, but I think we're both, uh, fairly findable on the internet. Uh, if you want to, uh, get in touch with either of us, uh, but certainly, uh, Paul Barrett, the center for business and human rights at NYU Stern school of business. Um, thank you. Um, and I believe I will turn it back over to Nyelati. Yeah. Well, thank you once again to, to both of you, Justin and Paul, really for leading us through an important and wide ranging conversation, Justin, as you, as you mentioned, this was a conversation that touched on the connections between the online and offline world, including the kind of cheerleading in Paul's words that is often needed to incite political violence, the importance of context of political systems, sociocultural realities that dictate the use of social media and the type of violence that it can facilitate. And then of course, ending the conversation with um, important re uh, reform recommendations, um, both for the social media industry and also for the lawmakers that are detailed in the report. So this is definitely a conversation that could have continued for several more hours, but I have the duty to bring us to a close um, and thanking not only the both of you, but everyone who joined us today. Um, this video, along with a summary of the discussion, will be made available on hfg.org. Uh, we invite everybody to learn more about our Violence, Politics, and Democracy initiative uh, by visiting our website and signing up for our newsletter. Uh, feel free to follow HFG on our social media platforms at your own peril, I guess. Um, but this includes more information um, on our speaker series events, our publications, our grants and funding opportunities. So you can follow us on Twitter slash X at HF Guggenheim. Um, Justin, we are still on X, uh, but we're also on Facebook and LinkedIn at Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. So thank you to all of you, and we hope to see you in the next installment of HFG's Violence, Politics, and Democracy Speaker Series. Thanks, everyone. Thank, thank you. you.